Hello everyone and thank you for joining our webinar, Five Key Things to Know About the Cloud and ERP. My name is Laurel and I'll be your host today. We're very fortunate to be joined by George Trudell, a partner at Ultra Consultants. George has over 30 years of supply chain and technology experience in helping mid-sized manufacturing and distribution companies improve their businesses and has worked in consulting for 15 years. He has deep experience with both process and discrete clients and ERP projects. George is APEX certified and he's taught classes and spoken at conferences on the topics of business process improvement, ERP selection, and implementation, and today we add cloud ERP to that list. Before we get started, I want to review how you can participate in today's web event. You should see something that looks like this on your own computer in the upper right-hand corner. During the presentation, you have the ability to send questions to us through the questions panel. Simply type in your question and click send, and at the end of the presentation, we will have a Q&A session to answer any questions you submit. So we have a great agenda planned for today. First, George will be taking you through the five key things to know about the cloud and ERP. Then we'll take a brief, a brief look at one example of a cloud ERP system, NetSuite. And at the end, we'll answer your questions during the Q&A session. So before we begin, I'll tell you uh, really briefly a little bit about Terillium for those who are not familiar with us. Terillium is an Oracle Platinum partner, and we're specialized in enterprise resource planning consulting. We help businesses with Oracle ERP Cloud, J.D. Edwards, and NetSuite. We're a 12-time Oracle Excellence Award winner, and our team of 150 full-time consultants across the United States have an average of 16 years experience with ERP. We've helped more than 500 businesses with Oracle Enterprise Solutions. And with that, let's get started with the main topic of today's event. George, welcome to the webinar. Hey, this is George. Thank you, Laurel. I think uh, first things first, if we could uh, switch over to our presentation. Okay, so five things, five key things to know about cloud ERP or cloud and ERP. Let's go to the agenda slide here. Let me kind of talk through what we have for today. So first things first, I um, wanted to give you just a slide on who Ultra is, just so you guys have that. And then really talk about five areas of cloud ERP. So first of all, defining what it is, and then really talking about it from an executive's point of view. You know, how do we save money? How do we reduce risk in the process? And how do we improve productivity? So those are the three key areas from an executive perspective. And then ultimately kind of pull that together and do an ROI. So those are our five areas we're gonna cover. Also, uh, in the, in the few minutes we have, I'll give you a brief idea of a case study of one of Ultra's clients who went through this process and selected NetSuite. And then just a couple slides where you can find out uh, some more education materials about Ultra. Okay. Um, and the next slide, let's just get past this introduction slide here and go to the detail slides. You know, Ultra was founded in 1994 in Chicago. Our focus is uh, always and continues to be 100% manufacturing and distribution clients. So that's what our clients are. You can see kind of a break up there over to the right. Um, all of these, in all these categories, there are distributors and manufacturers. We are vendor independent. So while we're presenting here with Trillium and talking about NetSuite, we do um, offer our clients an independent service of the vendors themselves. And we help them through the process to find the right vendors to work with. Uh, over 300 projects, 20 different vendors have been selected and 40 different vendors have been looked at throughout that effort. So I think that speaks to our objectivity. On the next slide then, um, just real briefly going over our 
methodology. You know, we start with our clients and basically do four things. We go through an effort to design business processes or kind of redesign, if you will. We usually go through some sort of selection. Most of the time, that's some sort of ERP selection, ultimately helping our clients implement that solution and then bringing business value through business transformation. That's, that's underlying everything we do in all of our service tracks throughout that process. Now, um, given that today's effort is really to learn about cloud, I don't want to spend a lot of time in Ultra, so let's get on to the next set of slides. Okay, so what is cloud ERP? Now, there's a number of different terms that are used interchangeably. However, each term is, truly has a specific meaning. So as you look at this first term here, SaaS, well, what SaaS uh, does not mean is that the software is in the cloud. SaaS is merely a payment term. So SaaS means how I'm paying for it. It means I'm paying as I go, right? So, but all true cloud applications use this type of payment where we're paying monthly. You know, the word cloud is also uh, overused today. All it really means is that your business is um, accessing a system that's not in your building, not on premise. So it's a delivery model and it's how you receive the system. The next term, co-location, uh, really got started back in the old Ross Perot days, where an organization is brought in to run your IT infrastructure. <clears throat> it's similar to that. Basically, it's outsourcing your IT functions while keeping the hardware on premise. So there's somebody else running your hardware in your building. It's an interesting model. Don't hear as much about it today, but um, I you know, didn't want to leave it off the list. On premise, that's probably what most of the people uh, who are listening in today. You know, we say the we say it's the hardware, and therefore the hardware and the software is on premise or in your building. What it's really saying is that we we've taken responsibility for everything, and everything includes um, key services like upgrades that are performed by our staff and not by the vendor or some sort of third party. So on premise really takes on these three different features of cloud at the same time. The delivery is on site, the upgrades are our responsibility, and we've paid for it 100% up front. So that's really, I premise really takes on all three of the features that we're talking about. As we look at virtual private cloud, also takes on three features. You know, all that's happened here though is we've moved the hardware off site. Your company still needs to determine when and how much to upgrade both the software and the hardware. So Delivery is off-site, so it's in the cloud. Rackspace, OneNeck, you know, the, the big player in the market is uh, Amazon, AWS. They have like 40% market share in this, in this area. You know, the upgrade, though, is primarily your business's responsibility, and you've usually paid for it 100% up front. So as we look at the bring-your-own-license model for BYOL, you know, this is, all this is saying is you bought it ahead of time. So it's another term, another vernacular to say, hey, I bought my license and I brought it to that virtual private cloud, for instance. It's the exact opposite of SaaS. The last two really begin to define what cloud is. And there's two different types of cloud offerings when people really start to talk about true cloud. And we're going to get in the next few slides and define more of those things. You know, an off-site or hosted delivery method is what single tenant is. This delivery method is typically where the vendor's taken on the management of the upgrades and the ERP system at their facilities, right, or, or their rented facilities. But there's only one company per database, and it's just the software. So this is not what NetSuite is, but this is what many of the other uh, vendors in the market are offering. So. From an ultra perspective, uh, we don't see anything wrong with this method. It's just good to know that uh, how it's set up because it does affect how, you're, uh, how much you're paying. As you start to look at the multi-tenant solution, which is how NetSuite's set up, this is a single tenant um, as well, except that there are multiple companies on the same database or instance. So this isn't, I'm sorry, this is the same as single tenant except that you, know, you have multiple companies or on the instance of the database. So it's really important to understand the difference here. I have multiple companies on one database and instance, and therefore it's a lot less costly for the vendor, NetSuite, to provide you that service. And therefore you're getting a slightly better deal in the end when you start to look at pricing. Okay. 
So we talk about cloud formations, right? And these cloud formations take on three aspects, as you saw earlier in the slide. There's a delivery model. You know, it's on-prem, on-site versus off-site or in the cloud. There's payment terms. The whole ownership, do you own it? Or is it a subscription that you're paying for as you go? The upgrade, who's doing the upgrade? The vendor or the business? And if the vendor is doing it, do they do it automatically or does the business have a choice as to when this happens? So this third option here, this third feature, is really one of the big differences in looking at a cloud-based offering versus something that is on-prem. So the way the formations start, the first, very, the first formation that we usually think about is on-premise or co-located. Kind of, we kind of threw that one in. Where everything is on site, right? You own the license, you brought your own license, and the upgrades are 100% your responsibility. So that's the first method. Um, you know, as you look at this model, you know, everything is, everything is really owned by you and uh, any activities here happen as you want them to happen by you. Now granted, you can, bring someone in as a consultant to help you out, but basically you're responsible for everything. In a virtual private cloud scenario, all that's really changed is you're not responsible for the hardware, right? You, um, you found a provider to host it and, and they're hosting it for you. Um, you know, I mentioned uh, AWS is the leader in this area, so basically you've taken your servers out of the building Great part about that is you don't have to go out and procure new servers. So when you need to upgrade, you need to let Amazon know about it, and you can make that happen. So that's really what's changed. Um, as we go on to the next slide then, it gets to be a little bit more interesting. The almost cloud category is something we do see some of our clients moving to. Now, I think this category is going to slowly go away over time in the next few years, but it still exists today. And this is one of the recommended areas that we think it's good for our clients to go to. If you're trying to get to cloud, you know, maybe you're not, maybe you're not being offered a true cloud offering, but it's okay to be at this offering. Um, but let me get into why. So the vendor or the partner owns the upgrades. And that's the critical part here. The break fix, if something happens between the database and the operating system, they own it. You know, usually um, you're on some sort of time and materials basis with the vendor and they'll offer customizations and report writing under that. The key is that the vendor or partner owns the upgrade. And that's usually, it may or may not be on a TNM basis, but the key point is they own it. Um, I've seen some of the other uh, applications um, that Oracle offers in this mode as well. So this is still a very viable method. And what you're getting for your money is you no longer are responsible for the hardware, of course. And you shouldn't be responsible for the operating system or the database or the upgrades. You still own the software, so it's a little bit different there, but you're paying a provider to do this. So this is beyond, you can't just give this to AWS. They don't offer those services. So this is going to, going to be some sort of Oracle provider for some other application that uh, might do that for you. Okay. The next one, um, as we start to look at it, we call it Cloud 1.0. This is kind of the first move that we've seen many of the vendors make. This is the first move to true cloud computing. The payment model is a SaaS-based model. Upgrades are automatic, but the only thing that's different is that the application is a single tenant database. The only thing that's different from multi-tenant is that it's a single tenant database with instances of the software, right, and the database. So most of the vendors that are touting cloud solutions today are really offering this single tenant or cloud 1.0 approach. The cool thing here is that it is a subscription. Um, the interesting thing is that the upgrades are mandatory, whereas in the almost cloud scenario, they may or may not have been mandatory. Usually they're not. In this scenario, they usually are. By mandatory though, you might not have to do it like um, they do it today for someone like, um, I'll let's say it's salesforce.com where you get, I don't know if anyone else is using that, but over the weekend you'll get the message that they're upgrading and boom, the upgrade happens. This upgrade, you may have a choice or a window as when to make it. Okay, the next offering is um, Cloud 2.0, which is a true offering of cloud that is a multi-tenant solution. You know, Net, 
NetSuite, Salesforce, Plex, Canandy, Rootstock, or a few of the other guys in the market that offer this kind of thing. But NetSuite really offers this um, as, you know, and started there, and that's all they've done, right? So the great thing about this offering is it started here. It wasn't something that started in the 1.0 and moved over. This is a true multi-tenant solution. And the only difference here is that it's on multiple, you're allowed to have multiple people on the same database, for instance. This offers flexibility to NetSuite and therefore offers you a better price. Right? So from our perspective, we don't see a big difference in one versus two, um, except for the cost should be a little bit less with this offering. You know, big difference from uh, what do I get for my money. The last one is where everyone's going. Um, in the next model in Cloud 3.0, what we see is our clients moving to much larger, much larger organizations, and they're moving this across the world. Today, if you're going to have um, a worldwide organization on one of these solutions, you might need a separate database slash instance slash offering in one country versus another because of latency and communications. Where Cloud 3.0 is going is it eliminates that. While you might have two separate systems, at least the initial designs that I've seen, you still might have two different systems, but they're synced up in the background. So from your perspective, it's still one. You're not having to do that manually. It's not like there's two different systems or two different companies being run, right? So it's all going to happen behind the scenes. We're not there yet, but that's where I hear it's going. So if we go on to this last slide then, what you see here are the, the key things that I'd like to point out. First of all, the delivery model on-site, versus offsite is the first defining factor of a true cloud solution and offsite is the definition of cloud. The second method is that it's a, the payment schema or the subscription model is the way it's paid for. And then the last thing is who owns the upgrade? Is it by the vendor? And if it is by the vendor, is it mandatory by the vendor, right? So who owns that and do you have to do it? So those are the three plus things that we'd like to look at when you think about cloud and you're trying to understand which one of the different ways you'd like to implement cloud in your organization. Now, typically, you won't have a choice. Um, the next area you want to get into is, is, uh, is how to save money in this process, right? So as we step back and say um, we're moving to cloud, well, why would we move to cloud? Well, the first reason you're going to move to cloud is you hope to save money. Right? The whole reason of doing this is, is to save money. It's not just to... Uh, move something out of the building. You know, internal staff costs are high. As we look at training and we turn over these uh, varied and changing applications, right, there's so much of our hardware, uh, so much of our staff that needs to have to be trained on all the new things in the new applications. You know, hardware is a side benefit to this, maybe even a break even, except when it comes to upgrades. The upgrade is a big deal. So as we look at training and turnover, right, versus, and then the upgrades on top of it, that's where we're really saving money. So it's not just the internal staff cost plus hardware. You have to add in training, turnover, and the upgrade you're going to have to do of hardware um, later on in the process. So don't forget all those costs when you're trying to evaluate cloud solutions versus on-prem. Okay, the second area that as we talk about this, I'm sorry, as we start to talk, continue to talk about saving money, there's new instances implementation costs. And this was a quote from um, tech, tech Target. I saw this on the Rootstock site. Um, where cloud ERP deploys faster, it's easier to use, and the access to information is from anywhere at any time by any device. So it's really important to understand that the ease of use is a, is a big factor in saving money as well. From an alter perspective, when we're working with our clients, it's all about your business process changes that are allowed to happen incrementally over time. You know, as the cloud software is updated, you're going to be upgraded. So it's up to you to decide whether or not you want to take on those business changes versus waiting five to 10 years for the next upgrade. And I know we say, oh shoot, we're not going to wait. That happens over and over again because the upgrades from one ERP version to the next is a big deal. So this is where the market's headed. Everyone is moving to cloud. Um, so it's, and it's because of this upgrade issue that's really at the core of why vendors are pushing cloud. As we look at the third reason why, or the third factor here in looking at cloud, it's about reducing risks. Now this is something that seems backwards to most people, right? Most people think the cloud is a higher risk. 
actually the focus on cloud computing and the focus of that business is to protect you from outsiders, right? I can't have a cloud solution like NetSuite being offered and then have the system go down because I was attacked or have my information taken away. So if anything, they're going to be hyper diligent about protecting you against the rest of the world versus your own staff and all the other things they have going on. Therefore, the investment is very high in this, right? And they have the money to make it happen. Uh, one of the other things that uh, comes up as you talk about security, it's not just um, having a great firewall out there and stopping people from getting in, but consider how many times that your employee, you know, leave a device somewhere. The, the example, of course, is Starbucks where I'm online, I'm searching for things, I'm on some network that's not protected. So these are the real security risks as we go forward. Those are the things we need to be focused on. Know that your cloud provider, in this case NetSuite, is going to be much more diligent than you ever would about people breaking into your system directly. The fourth area of improvement then is really in the area of productivity. And as a consultant, this is the area we, we like to talk about the most, most. So you should have a limited need for bolt-on solutions, but they do exist. And there's integration tools to make those happen, right? The flexibility and ease of use with the latest look and feel, that was that tech target quote earlier, right? So that ability to have something that's easy to use, that my employees want to use, that's the latest look and feel is a big deal. Um, and we've already seen um, NetSuite go through this, right? They've gone from one look and feel to another. They've upgraded their look and feel to keep up with what's new in the market and help your employees stay current as well. You know, organizational ERP currency, though, is one of the big things we see, which is that you're able to stay current with what's going on in the market. You know, so as your ERP applications in the cloud, it's easier to attract talent, which is awesome. And by looking forward, where the business is supported by up-to-date technology that's current. What we see a lot of times with our clients is a spreadsheet is supplementing the fact that I can't do this new thing in my system. So what we're seeing for the future is that cloud offering or maybe a bolt-on solution is going to help me get there without having to go back to spreadsheets and things that are no longer part of the system. Okay, the fifth thing I wanted to cover is ROI. I've got a couple more slides here on ROI that I'd like to go through before I get to the um, case study with Dixon. So why now? Well, the ROI multiplier by Nucleus Research, another, another firm that does um, a lot of work in this area, is, is they're saying is 2.1 of a cloud ROI versus an on-prem one. Now, there's a lot of factors that go into that. You know, the implementations usually of cloud solutions are less. Um, but what's interesting is they're seeing it increase. So from an ultra perspective, right, we're saying, hey, as you move forward with your ERP from an on-prem deployment to a cloud, the re it's, it's not just about moving, but it's about reducing the risk as well as the cost versus keeping your current system. So you're looking to reduce risk and cost at the same time versus what you would be doing with your current. As we look at this model going forward and try to put an ROI together um, on this uh, I think this is slide 29 here on application readiness. That's the first thing you need to look at, right? So is it so risky? Is it no longer upgradable? Do I not have the right people in place to make it happen, right? So if I can't get the system upgraded, it's a huge risk, and, uh, you know, this should be the time. Security comes into play here as well. There's a lot of legislation going on with HIPAA and PCI and, you know, that you're being faced with with your current systems. So ROI or a part of the ROI are all the things that you're having to do external to kind of prop up your existing system that should go away as you get into this new system that's cloud-based that stays current. As you look at the cost side of the ROI, right, you may have acquired different businesses which are running different packages. And your team might be managing multiple ERP systems. So the cost of managing these systems and the cost of upgrading one to replace the other is probably prohibitive, right? So this is where you also need to come back and start to look at the cloud ROI here is that if you've got multiple systems, it'll be a lot less expensive 
to move them to this cloud solution. Not only having one system, but the process of moving them over is going to be much less costly. One of the things that's overlooked a lot is culture. Um, the flexibility of the cloud offering allows your culture and your company to move forward without your systems uh, pulling it back. And we talk a lot about lost talent because the systems are so out of date that it, it impedes your employees' ability to reach the results they want to have, and we end up with this spreadsheet proliferation as well. As you start to look at to why you want to move forward, it's about organizational readiness, right? Are your, are your employees current with your system? Um, you know, are they able to make the changes that you need to make as you move forward? So this is one of the steps in the process. You've got you to evaluate yourself to say you're ready. Integration and technology capabilities, the ability to customize and excel, as I've mentioned, a heavily modified system is a big risk. And it's a big cost. There's a lot of hidden costs in all these Excel spreadsheets. And it's not the cost of the spreadsheet, it's the cost of all the time to maintain that spreadsheet. And then the last one, which is um, you know, kind of the obvious one, is the whole ongoing support, my ability to replace new people, uh, old people with new people, and uh, you know, who's going to keep the system going. Okay, moving on to the, the um, case study here with Dixon. Um, I, I wanted to talk a little bit more about who they are first. So on this next slide, um, you know, they've been around since 93. They're a company that's been growing steadily and they have been for a number of years. They manufacture instruments and they measure environmental conditions such as temperature, humidity, water pressure. You know, so they're a manufacturer. Their, their ideal customer is one that needs to be regulated um, or has some sort of operational requirement that needs to monitor their environment. So a lot of the new regulations are driving more business for Dixon. Uh, big markets are food and manufacturing, pharmaceuticals, and even some of the transportation markets. Uh, they also sell to municipalities as they, um, you know, trace uh, as they need have uh, wastewater facilities as well. So it's you know the environment's really driving their business. So that's who Dixon is. Uh, why cloud? This was the fun part when we start to look at the Dixon. Um, their current system was nearing their end of life, right? Um, but that wasn't just it. Uh, they'd been running it for 15 years, and so many of the issues, and, and so much was obsolete. They weren't using some of the modifications that happened, and it, they, it was kind of forcing their hand. But the second point they had when we started working with them was an increasing need of support to maintain the modified system. They had over 200 customizations in their system and uh, to their core ERP, and the support level of all this customization was getting out of hand. For operational efficiencies, there was a lot of workarounds taking place, a lot of spreadsheets, and so they're looking at a new system to solve these issues. You know, a big driver was identifying new sales prospects as well. So CRM was an important part of this as they're a technology-based company, but their ERP system wasn't, wasn't up to speed with that either. Uh, so for example, uh, they have one product called Dixon One, which is a data aggregator uh, that gathers data from multiple data loggers and shows in one interface that it can be accessed from anywhere at any time. So this may sound familiar because it's a cloud-based product as well. Dixon wanted to present their customers not only with this kind of leading-edge product, but they also wanted their company to be on leading edge technology, which is one of the reasons they started to look at cloud. With their large customer base in CRM, they needed a better way to manage it and mine that data, and they needed to have that available to all their employees everywhere they were. And then um, I did mention that they're a growing company, and they're anticipating big growth, so they needed to manage this growth appropriately. This was, I think, the ultimate factor then in why they chose cloud. It was as they saw their company growing and moving in the future, and they saw the modification and enhancements they had to make previously, they didn't want to repeat all of those problems from before. They didn't want to have this upgrade problem that they have today. And they wanted the business to be able to grow, uh, I'm sorry, they wanted the software to be able to grow with the business versus the software kind of pulling the business back. So they're really looking for a long-term solution, and they did not have a big IT staff. On the next slide then, you know, we see, um, sorry, I lost my place there. On the next slide, then, 
we see that um, in addition to the cloud-based solution, they had a number of other cloud applications they were using already. And they viewed, and from what they saw was there was a lower upfront cost, which was also very appealing to Dixon versus the on-premise and the hosted solutions. The factors that led up to this were the scalability that was attractive to Dixon. They didn't want to add any hardware. Um, the automatic upgrades that we talked about earlier was a big feature for them. You know, they didn't want to be locked into some sort of current unsupported version that they had to pay a lot of money to get upgraded. And then the IT cost to support it. You know, they don't like I said. I initially said they're um, they don't have they don't have a large IT staff. So um, and they didn't have a lot of people that are very technically adept. So having a system that was easier to work with in a cloud versus an on-premise solution that needed a significant amount of IT support wasn't something they wanted to do. Ultimately, system accessibility was a big factor. You know, with all with the number of their people working in the field, they wanted that flexibility. They could VPN into the legacy system, but it wasn't as accessible from smartphones and tablets from a remote location. And this is one of the hidden things that we're missing here as we look at cloud: is that so many of the enhancements are happening. It's in happening in, but it's happening in newer um, devices, and our old systems aren't able to keep up. The improvements are being put into the cloud solutions, and that's another reason why we want another reason we want to get there. And another big factor for them was um, that their vendor was an ERP vendor, but it wasn't responsible for what was happening. So if there was an emergency, um, they didn't they didn't know who to go to. So while they're a growing company, um, you know, they wanted to offload the support to somebody else who could really monitor it for them versus having to do it all themselves or, or hire an outside consultant day to day. So that was the factors in Dixon actually moving to NetSuite. I think what's interesting about that is that they're a manufacturing company um, that basically implemented NetSuite out of the box with no modifications. In fact, I talked with some of the consultants from Ultra that worked on this engagement. It was really impressive how they had a few enhancements or modifications they wanted to make. And as they looked at them, they figured a way around them and were able to go live, I think, with just one enhancement made to the system that is, as, as we've talked about, exists outside the system and they're able to continue going forward and upgrade NetSuite. Okay, one couple more slides on Ultra here. Uh, from an education perspective, um, if you want to learn more uh, about cloud, we have a number of white papers out there. Um, we have some webinars that are happening as well. We have a calendar out there of webinars and there's some case studies of which Dixon is one of that's online as well. As we look at other education resources, um, you're going to see a lot of blogs um, going on the vendors. There's a couple blogs that we have out there right now about NetSuite. We were at the conference a few weeks ago and saw some really cool things. In fact, all the new features of NetSuite, both for manufacturing and distribution, are bulletized in one of the blogs out there. So it's a great little uh, cheat sheet, if you will, as to what's coming and what's new in NetSuite. And then lastly, um, we have a lot of white papers. There's a new one that we just wrote on uh, wholesale distribution on Amazon. It's a great white paper uh, to look at if you're a distributor, trying to understand how to compete in this kind of Amazonified market, if you will, and not necessarily going to compete with Amazon, but how do you who, stay in business with someone like Amazon in there and actually make money at it? So that's a that's a great white paper as well. And we have a number of other white papers there. Laurel, I think that's it for my section, if you guys want to take it back. Okay, great. Thank you so much, George. Okay, well, uh, thank you again, George. As a reminder, if you have any questions um, on anything that George just presented, please type those into the questions panel. Um, and then next, we're going to take a quick look at NetSuite, one of the leading cloud ERP solutions available today. And we actually also have on, on the webinar John Adams from the Trillium team who is a, in our um, NetSuite practice. So he's on and available for any questions that might come up regarding NetSuite as well. Um, so I'll go ahead and start this video. It's um, about three minutes, and it's geared towards 
um, CIOs and IT executives, but it has you know relevant information for all business leaders. Um, if you if you're interested in a more in-depth demo, just send us a message or um, shoot me an email, and we'll we'll follow up after. But I'll go ahead and uh, start this. Welcome to NetSuite. The convergence of several market trends, such as globalization, changing business models, technology inflection points, financial uncertainty, and consumerization of IT has changed your role as the CIO. With current systems, you're fighting tomorrow's war with yesterday's technologies. As the CIO of a global organization, you want to avoid a piecemeal approach to adopting technology that results in islands of automation and separate operating environments. NetSuite's cloud business management solution enables you to partner with key stakeholders in bringing together all the global business applications, such as finance, sales, marketing, support, operations, and IT administrator in one seamless business software solution. Business models are constantly changing. You need a platform that empowers you to configure and customize, integrate and extend NetSuite to meet your specific business needs. NetSuite eliminates version lock by ensuring customization always migrate forward automatically with every release. With pre-built integrations and third-party connectors, NetSuite provides complete flexibility to extend and integrate your NetSuite solution with other business applications. With a community of thousands of developers and hundreds of apps that are built on its platform, NetSuite can address specific needs in a variety of industries. NetSuite's proven, secure, reliable, and scalable infrastructure and NetSuite's data management policies provide you with the peace of mind knowing that your data is replicated, backed up, and available whenever you need it. NetSuite provides a host of advanced functionality to secure the application. Stringent round-the-clock monitoring, controls, and policies ensure strong compliance and operational security. NetSuite provides complete transparency by providing system status at all times. NetSuite's highly scalable infrastructure supports thousands of global organizations of all sizes with billions of customer transactions and requests per month. NetSuite allows you to be strategic in tackling today's business problems while supporting and future-proofing your business a future punctuated by both accelerating and disruptive change. Okay. Um, all right. Well, thank you again for joining us. If you um, have any questions, we'll, we'll stay on the line here for a couple of minutes and please send those in. Okay, it looks like um, we've got a couple of questions. George and John, are you on the line? I'll go ahead and uh, start with some of these. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Okay, so one question is, how long does it take to implement a cloud solution? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that one, Laurel. Um, so one of the uh, benefits of a cloud ERP system is that the time and cost is typically not as long as a traditional implementation, especially for an on-premise system. Um, NetSuite has done a really great job of tailoring their methodology to um, implementing in as little as 100 days. They, they have a focus called Suite Success, and they really make sure that they're using the industry best practices and have a fixed scope implementation methodology. Okay, great, thank you. And then I think, George, you touched on this, and I know the video did a little bit too, but um, another question that we have is, are modifications and integrations to other systems possible in the cloud? So uh, absolutely. So I think a critical point there is, you know, all of the providers like NetSuite offer that ability. Um, so that you can make enhancements to the system 
but you're not changing the you know the main system itself. So you can make those enhancements, and then as you uh, get the upgrade, as they move forward with their release schedules throughout the year, you're you're still live and current with what's new. Um, having said that, um, there are other tools. There's these tools called iPaaS, or Integration Platform as a Service Providers, that um, is something that is going to be coming more and more commonplace where you have a tool set that allows you as an IT organization to connect NetSuite to some other third-party application like maybe a demand planning tool that you found that you really liked. So the idea here though is that your IT staff, instead of spending their time making modifications, they're really invested in making sure the systems are integrated well and operating between each other. So that's the real emphasis then going forward of that, that IT staff. Okay, great, thank you for that. All right, and so we'll uh, wait a couple more minutes here. Please send in any questions you might have using the question panel. Um, and in the meantime, George, if you don't mind, I actually had a question <laughs> in mind as you were going through your sure. presentation. I was curious what you know, what you and what Ultra recommend as far as you know, what's the first step in looking at this. Well, you know, as we go through the effort, we like to see our clients step back and think about where they want to go as an organization. So don't just find something that replaces what you're doing today. So the first step is try to figure out kind of what that future state should be, put the business case for together, and then go out and find the, the right software that fits that. So as you're looking for the justification for cloud, it should be in there, right? So as you're going, you know, all the different steps in justifying cloud, the, the cost is the easy part, but it's really identifying the people costs, I'm sorry, the, the new costs are really easy to understand, but understanding the justification is understanding your people costs, you know, the upgrade costs, all the other things you're going to have to spend to stay on-prem as you look to move outside of that and go to the cloud. So a lot of uh, executives are pushing back on this. If you can show them a real hard justification, I think it makes it a lot easier to start. So I see two things up front. One, make sure you understand where you want to go and how you want to improve the business. And then two, make sure you've got your ducks in a row as to why cloud's a better solution and where the cost savings are and what it means to the organization. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Thank you for that. All right, it doesn't look like we've had any other questions come in, but George, I want to thank you so much again for that. That was a lot of um, good information and a lot of helpful information. So if anyone has any follow-up questions after today, please feel free to contact George or contact me. I've got our uh, emails up on the screen here, and we'd be happy to, to answer any follow-up questions. So thank you again, George, and thank you to, to John as well for, for joining us today. Thank you all for having us. Great, and thank you to everybody that joined us. Enjoy the rest of your day.